Okay, so please uh, welcome Eleni Salakis. Eleni has a fascinating uh, conversation to have with us tonight. We know after the uh, filming and the presentation we had with Mel the last time around, just what happens when we have these layers of trauma that we're not assisting people to heal in our communities. Whether it's harming self, harming others. It's, it's just part of this trauma that is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger in our society and our young people are being hugely affected. Eleni's story is just, oh my God, it is, it is so inspiring. I know it's heart-based and there's pain there, but also just with what Eleni is now uh, taking her experience both professionally and personally and helping other women. So please uh, welcome Eleni. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thank you for coming tonight and hearing a conversation that I don't think is often talked about because there is a lot of stigma and misunderstandings about it. So I think Robin titled my talk, Prison Was Never On My Bucket List. And it wasn't. It was never anything that I planned, never anything that I thought I would experience, but that experience helped me unlearn decades of unhealthy thought patterns that I thought of myself. And if it wasn't for that unlearning and that experience, I wouldn't even be able to stand here and talk to you about this because I'd be so worried about what you thought, what you thought of me. And from my late teens, that became a thought pattern that I had of what people thought of me. And the, the sequence of events, the key events that I'll talk about tonight, will link what happened in my late teens, early 20s, and then decades later, what was connected to a few poor decisions that I made that saw me spend 11 months in prison. And it wasn't till the support of a forensic psychologist when I was going through the court process that I, she helped me connect the two. So I'll talk about some light bulb moments I've had in the last 12 years, and, but I'll start where I now see this originated from and um, I'll take you through that journey as best I can. So I don't know if any of you have seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. <laughs> Love that movie. When it first came out, I said to my brother, we've got to go and see this. So I'm the eldest of four Greek, uh, a family of four to Greek parents. Mum and dad were born on a tiny island in Greece. And please, as I go through this, I want you to keep in mind that I'm not laying blame on anybody but it's just how um, I, I viewed things at different stages in my life and how I now view things having got that help from a professional. So there's no blame game here. I'm just see, telling you how it was. So I said to my brother, we've got to go and see this. So we went and saw it and we couldn't stop laughing because everything was as we experienced, right down to mum telling us the Greek, the Greek root meaning of every English word and the plastic on the lounge chairs and tables and dad even telling us that metho was the cure for everything and it was Windex, which is basically metho anyway. So we just went home and said to mum and dad, you've got to go and see it, it's so funny. So they went and saw it and they came back and said, what's so funny about it? But being the eldest, I experienced um, a bit more strictness with the way mum and dad brought me up. Um, so when I got to my teenage years, and I grew up on the northern beaches, went to Cromer High School, went to DY Public School. Um, I, when my friends were starting to do things and go out to movies, go to the beach, I would always ask, can I do, mum, dad, can I go to the movies, can I go to the beach? 
and they would just say, Dad's line was, subjects closed, don't want to talk about it. So being brought up to respect your parents and being told that through those formative years, I didn't learn how to talk about how I was feeling. Because it was shut down, Sub subjects closed, don't want to talk about it. So I didn't, I just kept bottling everything up inside and wondering how do I get around this. So then I thought, when I got to about year 10, 16, maybe if I'm a good enough daughter, they will listen to me and I won't get that response. So I started doing all the chores around the house. The, the washing the dishes, the vacuuming, the mopping, cleaning up. And then I just thought, maybe I'm good enough now. I'll ask again. So I'd ask again. No, subject's closed, I don't want to talk about it. So going to school, if I walked to school, and I was in walking distance of Cromer High, and Dad, I saw Dad's car coming up the street and I was walking home with boys from school, I would just panic and hide behind a bush or run into someone's garage so he wouldn't see me. So this anxiety built up, but I didn't know it was anxiety and I didn't recognise it and was never, I never went to a doctor to talk about it. So I grew up fearful, I grew up wondering if I was good enough and if my parents really loved me because they weren't listening to me. That's how I interpreted it. So when I finished school, we went to Greece. Mum and Dad had been in Australia for 32 years, but they'd not been back. So they took us over there and um, I was excited to see the Greek islands. But another thought I had was, I've just finished school and school was the only place I saw my friends. So how am I going to see my friends now? And it got more than just sadness. I became very withdrawn. I was worried about how I already felt isolated through my teenage years and this played on me. And if you know anything about mental illness, some of the early signs, there's changes in eating habits, changes in sleeping habits, either way. And I, my eating habits changed where I didn't eat as much. It was not a conscious decision of I need to stop eating, I need to diet. It was none of those. I never weighed myself. It wasn't anything to do with my body or what I thought of my body. It didn't even enter my head. I just was not eating as much. And mum and dad said, what's wrong? Are you okay? You're not eating as much. And I went, oh, you're listening to me now. So I, in my thought process, thought if I start eating, are they not going to have this concern for me and maybe they now love me? So it grew into a fear of not food. It grew into a fear that if I start eating, my parents are not going to love me because they are now listening to me. And that was my underlying thought pattern. So. Um, I developed anorexia. My doctor was back in Australia. We were in Greece for six months. We, Mum took me to the doctor as soon as we landed back in Sydney and my doctor explained to me what anorexia was. He said, I believe you're suffering anorexia. And I said, what's that? So it's not something you wake up one day and decide, I'm going to behave like this. But those behaviours of wanting to be a better daughter and doing more around the house were this, was the same thought pattern that led to the eating disorder behaviours of more exercise, more restrictive eating, thinking if I do this more and more, I will be of value. It had nothing to do with my body. But on the surface, when you, you know, your body is affected so physically, people assume that it's a body image thing. And when they challenged me, um, anyone said to me, you know, why don't you eat more or why, don't you, why do you exercise so much? You've got to eat more. I would literally, I can feel the feeling in my body now clam up and go, don't you dare challenge me on this because if you take this away from me, I don't know how to deal with the emotions I'm feeling and I don't know how to deal with what's going on in my head. So, if you're, 
if you have anyone that you know is struggling with these issues, don't mention food or exercise because at that time, they might not have any other coping mechanism and they'll clam up. So for me, it was really frustrating because again, I didn't know how to express what I was feeling because I never learnt how to do that. So fast forward, the doctor put me on medication to try and increase my appetite and then he threatened to put me in hospital on bed rest. And this was in the 80s when there was not much around Psycho for psychological help on eating disorders. But I was grateful I had such a great doctor who bothered to read up on current things and he was fantastic. So I'm gonna cut a long story short. I physically recovered by um, when he said that he would need to put me into hospital on bed rest. I said, please give me one more chance because the thought of losing that control frightened me even more. So I stopped all the running that I was doing. I was running about twice a day, 10 kilometres each time, and was extremely underweight, didn't have my menstrual cycle for five years, um, not wanting to live because it was a battle every day. I don't want to live like this, but I don't know how to live without this. It was a real struggle every single day. Um, I stopped my running, I joined a gym and thought, I wonder if I can put on weight with resistance training. And that's how I got into the life of the gym. <laughs> and I went on to compete two years later in uh, women's bodybuilding, which again was just started off in the 80s and um, lost. I, I, I was gradually eating more because I thought if I can lift heavier weights, I need to eat more. And that broke the physical, um, like, poor health cycle. Got my period back five years later. So I was on the physical road to recovery. But this was never dealt with. So I got married in 1986, was married for 21 years, but the last eight years of that marriage, the same feelings came back because um, as soon as I was independent of being a stay-at-home mum and could go back to work, I have three adult children now, um, some controlling behaviours came out from my husband. And I never had a girls' night out in 21 years of being married. Um, when I went back to work a few days a week, it was like, you have to come home straight away. I'd get a call if I was 10 minutes late because I stopped to have a coffee with a girlfriend. Why aren't you home? I'm having a coffee. Well, you've got responsibilities at home, you know. Get home. I was a teacher, loved my job, um, loved going the extra mile. Um, you know, if parents were sick of students, I'd cook extra. And when I cooked meals and gave them out, it was just, who I was and what I did and, you know, to be told you are bullshit for wanting to help that many people or, or go the extra mile started crushing me more. Another thing I loved doing was singing and I would sing as I did the housework and, you know, piles of ironing and he'd come and turn the music off or if I performed at, at an event, he'd go, you know, you're just a loud Greek, you like the attention. So everything that was part of what I liked about me, bit by bit over eight years just got hammered. And I found myself coping the same way. So I started eating less and running more. And I had teenage children at that time. And I thought, if I do this, I'm teaching my kids that this is how you cope. And I took myself to my GP, um, and uh, she just said, you have severe clinical depression. I did the, the, t the DAS test with her and she was the first one that sent me to a psychologist and put me on medication for the first time. Even at home with that support, um, I wasn't supported at home with that medical support. It was a put down of 
me seeing a psychologist, a put down of me being on medication. So I didn't feel I could talk about uh, trying to deal with the issues I needed to. Um, and it was about nine months after I started treatment that my husband agreed to having some counselling together. And this was a, a light bulb moment that spiralled my mental health downhill even more. So in the last couple of years of our marriage, I felt like all he loved me for, and whether it was love, I don't, at that time I didn't think it was, was housework and sex. So I thought that maybe I'm wrong, maybe i am got this wrong perception about that, but in one counselling session, he was asked, what do you understand of Eleni? And he replied, I don't know. I only know when she's around, the house runs smoothly. And I just mm, thought, number one, tick. And then he was asked, what do you miss of Eleni? Because in those last two years, feeling like that, I would shut the bathroom door. I didn't want him to see me naked. And his answer to the next question just tipped me off. He said, I miss seeing her naked. And I just went, thought number two, confirmed. And I burst into tears and that session was ended. So that sent my mental health spiralling down. We ended up separating and um, I was rock bottom. And I, my self-worth was at its worst. And that led to, so a, a year after we separated, me making a couple of poor decisions, which I can't completely talk freely about here in this setting, um, that saw me break the law. And I was arrested four and a half years later. In that four and a half years, I was close to taking my life twice because of the guilt and the shame. I didn't want to tell a soul. And when the police knocked on my door and I was arrested, I just went into that same thought pattern. What are people going to think of me? And I thought, I thought I've thought this my whole life and always said yes, yes, yes to the people pleasing in order to feel valued because if I say yes and do more and more and more then I'll be valuable and um, I was arrested put on conditional bail uh, to go through the court process scared stiff about going through this because I'd never been in trouble with the law before no one in my family had been in trouble and that's when I met my forensic psychologist um, so forensic psychologist deals with people going through the court system and she was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, the second light bulb moment I had with her was in the second session and she said to me, Eleni, by the time we finish you're going to walk with your head held high. There's no way I believe that because I just felt like the worst human being on earth. I felt like everybody knew, even people, you know, I, I stayed in my apartment for two, two months after I was arrested. Um, I didn't want anyone to see me. My son said, Mum, you've got you've to get out. I said, I, I can't. And the first time he came out to the supermarket with me, which is right next door to where I live, I had a hoodie on, dark glasses on, in the supermarket. He goes, Mum, no, not everyone's going to know. I said, I don't care. I feel like everyone is pointing their finger at me because I was pointing the finger at myself. And um, when my psychologist said that, there's no way I believed her. And she went, she took me right back to my childhood 
and she broke my counselling up into real me and crushed me. And I had lots of written homework to do. I had to list real me behaviours, crushed me behaviours. And we talked a lot about the eating disorder, even though she's not an eating disorder specialist. And this is what I mean, get to the underlying reason as to why someone behaves the way they do, not the symptoms and the signs of what is projected. It's what's going on up here. And she said to me, what was your thought, the dominating thought pattern when you lived with anorexia? And I said, I thought about it and I said, if I don't do this, I won't be of value. And the next question was, what was your thought pattern right before offending? What was the dominant thought? And I just froze and went, if I don't do this, I won't be of value. And I just burst into tears and I'm getting teary now thinking about it. Why didn't I get help in my late teens for this thought pattern that transpired to an eating disorder, but everyone was so focused on the body, the food and the exercise. And I just, I, I lived with decades of this thought pattern that underlined everything that I do at work, at home, do more, do more, do more, and then the offending. So we worked on that. And it was a lot of hard unlearning to unlearn four decades worth. And then I had to, um, I hadn't pled guilty. I hadn't met my barrister. I hadn't told anyone the truth because I thought I'm too scared to face the truth. What will people think if I say, yes, this happened and it's true? And I had to meet my barrister this day and I had to enter a plea so he could um, plan his preparation according to what I pled. And I didn't know anything about the legal system, so I was learning as I went. And I was going up the lift to meet him in the city, and I was arguing in my head. And I have a Christian faith, and I was arguing with God. God, they don't know anything. They haven't got any, they haven't got any um, evidence. Um, it's all hearsay. Maybe I can just plead not guilty and hope for the best. And I, it got to the fifth floor and the door opened and I went, who am I kidding? If I believe that God is real and he knows everything, how can I go into a courtroom and plead before a, a, a human judge, not guilty, knowing in my heart that this happened? And I sat in the chair, the barrister explained for about an hour how the legal system works. And he said, so how do you want to play? And I just went guilty and lost it. It was like a four and a half year dam of holding and not telling anyone and of shame and of guilt just all spilled out. And they had to call my son to come and pick me up to take me home. And I got to my next psychologist session and I said, now I've pled guilty, I'm going to have to tell my family. I said, so what do I do? And she said, what would real you do? And I said, tell the truth. She goes, well, that's what you've got to do. And I thought, oh, I've got to tell my siblings, my kids, who are adults now. Uh, my youngest was in year 12 at school, so that was a really tough year to be going through this. And, um, and my parents, who were like my big, big fat Greek parents that I thought I had to please my whole life. And I thought, how am I going to tell them? So I started off with the easiest for me, and that was my brothers. And I was like, I can't tell you how hard it is for someone who feels she had to portray this perfect mother, perfect wife, perfect teacher image to say, I broke the law. It was extremely hard. So I said to my brothers, you know why I'm allegedly in trouble? Well, it's true. And they just put their arms around me and said, sis, you're our sis, we don't care, we still love you. 
and tears and those tears were of healing because someone loved me regardless. And then I told my kids and I can't tell you how hard that was to tell your children that their mother, who's supposed to be a role model, had broken the law. Um, and I got the same response. Mum, we don't care, you're our mum, we know what you are going through, we still love you. And then I thought, I've got to tell my parents. So I went round and sat on the dining table that, you know, was the, <laughs> the dining table of many arguments around food decades before and sorry I always get teary for this bit um, I said to them you know why I'm in trouble it's true and I burst into tears and the very next statement was do you still love me and mum just went of course we still love you you're our daughter and you're human and we know what you were going through at that time and I just said, I thought my whole life that I had to please you in order for you to love me. And mum just hugged me and I can't tell you the restoration of decades of believing that of myself that happened in that one moment. And my relationship with my parents now is the best it's ever been. Because of those moments of disclosure to those people that cared, that was just, um, like, I can't tell you the, the strength that that gave me. The other strength that uh, got me through was when I was sitting on my lounge in those two months of not leaving my apartment, I sat there and I said to God, God, even my church family is ashamed of me because no one is coming to see me or pray with me. They're ashamed. And I had this thought straight away, I was not ashamed of you when I hung on the cross. And I just went, where the hell did that come from? And I hung on to that and I thought, okay, I'm hanging on by my pinky to that faith and God, you've got to walk through every court appearance with me. You've got to walk no matter what happens. Um, ended up 15 months of the court process, which was so scary going through that. And I was single. I'm still single. Didn't, wasn't living with my son at the time, so night times was extremely hard. Uh, it was a, a fear of the unknown. Anyway, got to sentencing day, and I thought I might get a community order because any pre-sentence report done by psychologists, by probation and parole, all said non-custodial. So I didn't know what was going to happen that day. So I went uh, to sentencing and at the end of the hearing, the, you know, I was put up on the stand and the judge saw my remorse in his questioning but he said, the law is the law. And I accepted that. I got to the point where I accepted that because I had broken the law and it was wrong. What I chose to do was wrong. And I was ready to, prepare, to accept whatever was to come my way, but I was too frightened to, uh, too frightened to accept prison. And he said, uh, I'm going to take the weekend to read these documents and to make up my mind what the sentence should be, but for now you are going to be taken into custody. And I knew that I was getting a custodial sentence. And the officers from the corrections came and they, they handcuff you, you hand everything over, your jewellery, your handbag, your medication, everything. Um, and they take you downstairs to the cells and transported in an inmate transport truck and you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're taken to. And I got to Silverwater Women's and said, where am I? And they said, you're at Silverwater. And I, I, was, I just did not know what to expect. So frightened, so frightened. And the first thing they did, um, 
a female officer took me into a room and she said, you ever st been strip searched before? I said, no. Nope. She goes, well, you better get used to it. And having had this history of feeling that it was your, you know, that you were one loved for sex through your marriage, um, the history of how, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s on the northern beaches and the wolf whistles as, as cars as you drive by and again feeding that thought pattern that this is where your worth lies, mixed in with the low self-worth that you're already experiencing, to have to take your clothes off in that setting was like, all right, yes, I know I've done the wrong thing, but do I have to be strip searched? And you are then strip searched after every single visit you have. Um, you take it, have to take everything off. Um, that's part of the prison process and you never got used to it. You never got used to it. Um, the judge ordered that I continue having psychological help in prison at weekly. I had two sessions over the 11 months that I was sentenced. And I just have to tell you a statistic as well. There's a perception in the community that if women go to jail, they must be really bad women. BOSCA, which stands for the Bureau of Statistics, Crime and Research, update their statistics every quarter. Most women are sentenced to less than six or 12 months over 90%. So if you consider those short incarceration periods and then a third are in there on remand, not even sentenced yet, but now have been in custody and have to live with the label of a criminal record the rest of their lives. I can't tell you the stigma that that label creates, whether you have rehabilitated whether you have done all the work, whether you have learned or not, that label sticks. And people don't see the trauma before, they don't see the rehabilitation after, they just see the record. Um, and that is hard to shake. That actually impacts your mental health and has the potential to send you right back to where you started because of the exclusion, the isolation that you feel, and because you have to like yourself again after being labelled with a record. So I came out 11 months later and didn't want to waste this experience and the other light bulb moment I had sitting in that cell in Silverwater and then I was sent to Dilwinia, which is at South Windsor. Um, I sat there and my mental health was slipping for the first four months and I sat on the cell floor and I thought, you could starve yourself to death. That's, you know, you could really do that. You know how to do that. Straight away I thought, if you go back to that thought pattern, you have learnt nothing from this experience. And then I had to use all the tools that my psychologist had taught me in the community which is where my rehabilitation was done, not behind those prison gates. And I had to apply those every single day in that cell and I was locked up for 23 hours a day for the first four months, one hour out, and then I applied to go in the mainstream of the prison, which I got to. Um, but I had to apply those tools every day and I thought if this, this has to be the best training ground to apply those tools. So I came out thinking I need to use this experience and my professional experience, 28 years of professional experience, to teach and educate the community about mental health and uh, what happens when you're incarcerated and you know, how you rehabilitate after something. I wanted to break the stigma and my psychologist is big on educating the community to see the human behind the offence. And another, um, 
uh, statement that was made to me that goes in line with that was when I was standing in the medication line in prison, an officer must have seen the fear on my face and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, hey, any one of us can find ourselves behind on this side of the fence. She goes, there's a fine line between blue and green because inmates wore green, prison officers wore blue. And I still remember that and I went, you know, you're right. Any single person given the perfect life storm can find themselves on the other side of the fence. And um, I can't, that today still sticks with me and when I present uh, in the work that I do now, I often quote that and people go, yep. So I now run, uh, manage um, a program called Success Works which supports women with a criminal record back on their feet and into employment. And it's not just about supporting the women to there, we reach out to employers and educate them on if the offence has got nothing to do, sorry, if the role they're offering has nothing to do with the offence, what's the problem? And they go, oh, we never thought of that. And when we advocate for the women and sit in on um, interviews where if the woman is asked to disclose, we support them through that. And we've had managers call us back and go, oh my God, that could have been me. And I go, yep, it could have. And to date, we have supported 66 women with a criminal record into employment. And it's not just the employment, it is what it does for you as a person to be supported by people in the community to say you are worth it because you beat yourself up over and over again with this record. Every time you're not back, you are reminded to look backwards, not forwards. So what it does for their self-worth to be even given an interview is huge because they start believing that they've got more to offer than I'm frightened because I have a criminal record. It does wonders to this headspace. Um, I can't tell you, in the, I've been out in July this year for uh, eight years. I was released 31st of July 2014 and I can't tell you how many knockbacks I have had to get to this point even when I've won community awards and I've had a couple of people would call the organisations I've partnered with or got the awards from and disclose the offence and then they've taken the award from me publicly. Um, that sent my mental health back. And I went, why aren't you seeing what I've done in the last eight years? Why do you keep looking to the, the record? And, um, you know, I've been told by these organisations, oh, it's not you, we can see it's the risk of what it does to our reputation. When the award stood for diversity and inclusion, go figure. I go, come on, we have got to stop this. And it comes back to recognising your own vulnerability when it comes to your mental health and that, yes, anyone can make a mistake but also look at the work that someone's done to get their life back on track. Um, so I'm really proud of me now. I'm proud because the people that mind don't matter and the people that matter don't mind. And I've had that community support. I've had the support from my friends and family. And now the program that I manage has an MOU with Corrective Services. <laughs> I went back into Silverwater, uh, sorry, Long Bay Prison two weeks ago and presented in front of 60 senior correctional service officers and the commissioner. And I opened my speech up by saying, three weeks before I left prison, an officer said to me, oh, you'll be back. And they say that to nearly every person that leaves prison. How encouraging is that, hey? And I looked him in the eye and I said, no, I won't. And he said, yes, you will. I said, no, I won't. 
So I opened up by telling that and then I said to them, but I never thought I'd be back in this capacity sharing to you what I'm now doing. And it was just a full circle. And even today I was talking to a, a lady in corrections that we've got this um, partnership with and she said people are still raving about that conference where you spoke because I can't fake what I've been through and I can't, I don't want to fake it anymore because faking it when my marriage went downhill and putting on the pretense that everything was all right got me into more trouble than being honest and saying I was struggling because I was frightened of not portraying that perfect self that you think you have to. So thank you uh, <laughs> for listening. Thank you for um, allowing me to share and for being here tonight. Thank you.